Hi, this is from Memory in the Past, the show where we talk about people who died recently who had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start with our feature tonight, Alan Young, who died recently at the age of 96. Wonderful actor on radio and television, had his own show in early television, had his own show in radio, was the voice of Scrooge McDuck, but he became famous to millions of viewers because he was the owner of Mr. Ed and the only one Mr. Ed would talk to on their television show in the early 60s. It was based on a pilot from the late 50s, which was more sort of a 50s show. They brought it into the 60s, and they got Alan Young to star with Mr. Ed, and he could do comedy or drama. Here is the first time that Mr. Ed ever talked to his owner, Wilbur Post, played by Alan Young. You're going to stay after all. Isn't that great? Oh, I never thought owning a horse could mean so much to me. I guess it's because when I was a little boy, I wanted a pony. Of course, it's been a long time since I was a little boy. It's been a long time since I was a pony. <laughs> That's impossible. Did you say that? Oh, how could you? Did you say it? Why? Well, I didn't hear it. How could I? I did. Oh, this is impossible. I don't believe it. Now, while I'm looking right at you, Say something. Like what? Anything. How now? Brown cow. How do you feel? Fine. I wouldn't believe that horse could talk if the two of you stood there and say a do that. Why didn't you talk to my wife? I hate skeptics. You made me look like such a fool. You've got to talk to my wife. Why did you talk to me? Because I like you. The thing is fantastic. I just don't understand it. Don't try to. It's bigger than both of them. The show was financed by George Burns and had Jack Benny behind the scenes. The name vision is sort of a Laurel and Hardy thing with Mr. Ed, whose real name was Bamboo Harvester, and his voice was done by that old-time cowboy actor Rocky Lane. Well, that was a big challenge. How does a horse talk? Rocky Lane had been a big Western star. I mean, big. Uh, Alan Rocky Lane. And he was on his uppers because Westerns had kind of faded away. And he'd faded with them because he'd been a star years before. And he was sleeping on Lester Hilton's couch. And that was it. So we're taking photograph uh, publicity pictures. And suddenly we heard this voice come out. Hey, Lester, where'd you keep the coffee? Everybody looked. That's Ed's voice. So Arthur and uh, Al went to him and asked him, would he do the voice? Well, he allowed as he would, but uh, I was a star once, you know. I don't want to keep alone doing the voice of a horse. So they said, okay, we won't mention your name. You just do it. Well, when the show clicked, Rocky came to Arthur Lubin and said, um, I'd like credit for this. So Al Simon said, well, you know, if you look at the credits, it says Mr. Ed played by himself. Wilbur played by Alan Young. Carol played by Carl Wilbur gets credit, but Ed is doing it himself, and the kids believe that. So we can't change it now. So they gave him a raise, and he was happy. So he never got any credit for that voice. And that's, the, that's one of the main questions I'm asked. Who did the voice of the horse? To clarify, on his uppers is a British term for short of money, and Lester Hilton was the horse's trainer. Of course, what would Mr. Ed be without that theme song written by Jay Livingston and Ray Evans? Hello. I'm Mr. Ed. A horse is a horse, of course, of course, and no one can talk to a horse, of course. That is, of course, unless the horse is the famous Mr. Ed. Go right to the source and ask the horse. He'll give you the answer that you endorse. He's always on a steady course. Talk to Mr. Ed. You never heard of a talking horse? Well, listen to this. I am Mr. Ed. Yeah, that was uh, written by the same people who wrote Aaron Slick from Punk and Crick. Jay Livingston, Ray Evans, of course. I don't know who the singer was that did the, uh, the soundtrack, but his voice was so good, they said, let's keep him in. So they didn't have to get a singer to do it. Either Jay or Ray did it. I don't know which one. I had a songwriter friend come to me. He said, you know, this is how the show's gone on the air a little bit. I can write a song. That, that's awful, that song. That is terrible. Look, I'm a songwriter. I know a good song. That is, that'll never go. Well, Livingston and Evans have made more money out of that song through ASCAP, and they told me, than any of their other numbers. Jay Livingston was the one who sang it. Here are a couple of my favorite Mr. Ed episodes. The first one with Clint Eastwood, where Mr. Ed gets on a party line. Mr. Eastwood, the reason I'm calling, we have a big feature coming up soon, and I thought you might be interested in the starring role. It's a great script. Do you think you could get about six weeks off from your TV series? 
Oh, six weeks? Uh, well, I could sure try a many sets sir. But you couldn't afford me, you cheap old windbag. What did you say? I didn't say anything. Well, are you interested, Eastwood? Yes, sir. I, I'm, yes, I'm definitely interested, Mr. Darrow. But if you ever show your ugly push on the set, I'll quit. Who's <laughs> on the other end of this line? <laughs> In the famous episode where Mr. Ed works out with the Dodgers, including Leo DeRocher and Sandy Koufax. Gee, I'm going to meet my favorite Dodgers. Willie Davis. Johnny Roseboro. Scarron and the old strikeout king Sandy Colfax. Ed, you're a lucky horse. <laughs> Let's go, Wilbur. Say, is it okay if Sandy tosses one to him nice and easy? Uh, Ed wants to make a fool of himself. It's okay with me. All right, Sandy, nice and easy, huh, buddy? Okay, John. <laughs> I don't believe it. Hey, Alan Young did very well from the show because he ultimately got a piece of it. It wasn't, expen wasn't an expensive show. Oddly enough, and this is interesting, I think, to talk money for a second or two, I talked to Jerry Van Dyke about this because I did a guest spot on the show with Jerry, and I didn't realize what they were getting paid. $25,000 a show, $20,000, $50,000. He said, you know what my brother got, Dick? I said, what? $750 a week. I said, so did I. That's all I got. And that's what they got paid me. I was fortunate that when the show goes over, you uh, can rearrange things. And so you get little rearrangements made. And I was fortunate to get a piece of the show, which was very nice. But Dick Van Dyke got $750 a week for that show. He's not crying now because he's doing fine, but everybody thought, oh boy, you're making a fortune. And you weren't really. Of course, besides the money, there was a kinship between Alan Young and Mr. Ed. I would do anything for Ed. Alan Young was also a wonderful actor, and he did a great turn in the 1960 film The Time Machine, where he played the friend to Rod Taylor, who played H.G. Wells. He played both a son and a father. And here he is with Rod Taylor, whose podcast we've done right before a nuclear attack. Come on, young man, come on, come on. Philby, the name is Mr. Philby. Didn't you hear the air raid siren? You mean a horrible screeching? It wasn't constructed for its aesthetic value, young man, but to warn silly young fools like you to get into the shelter. Now, come along, come along. But, but I'm perfectly comfortable here, Mr. Philby. I, I, I've got to talk to somebody. This is fantastic. Your store is magnificent. The, the splendid achievements, the, the, the gigantic strides that mankind has taken. Come along, young man. Come along, come along. You better hurry or the mushrooms will be sprouting. Mushrooms? You look familiar. Haven't we met somewhere before? Indeed we have, Mr. Philby. Right there. Many years ago. Are you sure of that? Exact time escapes me. It was two wars ago. 1917. Now I recall the chap who inquired about my father and the house that used to stand across the way. Oh, no. No, that's impossible. You haven't changed. You're not a day older. And your clothes! No, don't worry, Philby. It'll take a little time to explain, but you see. That's the last alert! Hurry! Hurry! No, but listen, this is important! Atomic satellite zeroing in! That's important! Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Philby! Philby! Hurry! I feel the old clear! Well, from there, we have a natural segue into our next subject, Bill Hurz, who died recently at the age of 99, the last surviving cast member of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater production of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Probably the most famous radio broadcast ever done, and here's PBS to talk about the 1938 production. Orson Welles' War of the Worlds. Never before had a radio broadcast provoked such outrage or such chaos. Upwards of a million people convinced, if only briefly, that the United States was being laid waste by alien invaders, and a nation left to wonder how they possibly could have been so gullible. Brilliantly directed by Wells, the War of the Worlds would become in the end the most famous radio program in history, known forever after as the Panic Broadcast. Yet it all began unremarkably at a little past eight o'clock in the East, a Sunday evening like any other in America, with dinners being finished, dishes washed, and radios across the country turned on 
more or less in unison. The Columbia Broadcasting System and Station present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the Air in The War of the World by H.G. Wells. It was October 30th, the eve of Halloween, a night known variously as Mischief Night, Devil's Night, Hell Night, a night that for some 200 years had unleashed all manner of trickery on the unsuspecting. On this night, in 1938, it would also unleash the pent-up anxieties of a nation. Here's Orson Welles describing it to the BBC. And if you think this is an exaggeration, it's only a little while ago that I again ran into some welfare workers, Quakers and Red Cross people who had been up in the Black Hills of Dakota some five or six weeks after this broadcast, persuading the people to leave the mountains and go back home because Martians really hadn't come. All kinds of people reacted in all kinds of ways. For example, John Barrymore, the very famous American actor, this I know to be true, was listening to the broadcast, and although he was a friend of mine, ceased to identify me with the show and believed implicitly that America had fallen to the Martians. And hearing this on his radio, rushed out into his backyard where he kept ten Great Danes in a kennels and released the dogs, giving them their freedom, crying to them as they ran in all directions of the compass, the world has fallen, fend for yourselves. And I, st I still meet people all over the place, everywhere in the world, who've had experiences, bitter or otherwise, as a result of our little experiment in, in broadcasting. Just the other day I was coming here to England on the ferry and some people were in the next compartment on the, the boat train said to me, uh, there you are, Orson. Well, you sure scared us. We were on our honeymoon. My wife and I, I'm sorry to say that they looked very ancient couple, but there they were. I said, we were on our honeymoon and uh, had a little portable radio. We were out there by the lake and uh, Heard what you said, we come right back home, not spoil the honeymoon, but uh, glad to see yours. And that kind of thing has followed me all over the world since then. And a lot of people want to know what to do. As a matter of fact, they were phoning us from all over the place, some of them reporting that they'd seen Martians landing in their back yard and asking for advice. And there were others that claimed to have been attacked personally by Martians. The whole experience was extremely intense. I suppose we had it coming to us because, in fact, we weren't as innocent as we meant to be. When we did the Martian broadcast, we were fed up with the way in which everything that came over this new magic box, the radio, was being swallowed. People, you know, do suspect what they read in the newspapers and what people tell them, but when the radio came, and I suppose now television, anything that came through that new machine was believed. So in a way, our, our broadcast was an assault on the credibility of that machine. We wanted people to understand that they shouldn't take any opinion predigested and they should wallow everything that came through the tap, whether it was radio or not. Yeah, too bad Orson didn't live to see the internet. Here's Bill Hers. He's the reporter from Newark in the actual broadcast. Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, 24. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over, over Raymond Boulevard. 2X to L calling CQ. 2X to L calling CQ. 2X to L calling 8X3R. Come in, please. This is 8X3R coming back at 2X2L. To Eyes reception. Eyes reception. Hey, please. Where are you, 8X3R? What's the matter? Where are you? My dad was listening to that broadcast. He told me it was a great broadcast, but things happen too fast to really be believable. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. As a final tribute to Bill Hers and the War of the Worlds, we're going to play a great song from 1966 written by my man Roger McGuinn when he was with the birds. He had a great sense of humor. He wanted to contact alien life forms, and so he composed Mr. Spaceman. Woke up this morning with light in my eyes and then realized it was still dark outside. It was a light coming down from the sky. I don't know who or why. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along? I won't do anything wrong. Hey, Mr. Spaceman, won't you please take me along for a ride?